Hi everyone, I'm Max Forsyth, um, founder and MD of Com Search and Selection, at the specialist in-house communications, executive search and recruitment firm, and also the host of the Comms Coffee Club podcast. Delighted uh, for episode number nine to have the wonderful Louise Thompson, owner and founder of Louise Thompson on the line. Um, she is a uh, trained communications coach and we discuss great comms leadership skills. Also, we talk about lazy leaders, uh, traits and behaviours to look out for that perhaps could be a warning sign that you, you need a little bit of help in terms of your leadership skills. Lots of people, whether they start out uh, PR or internal comms agency side or in-house, quite often it's the best tactical executors of comms, PR, internal comms who tend to end up in leadership roles. Some people fly, some others don't. No one really teaches you how to manage or how to lead well, and that's both leading a team, but also managing upwards and you know, really leading communications or corporate affairs functions uh, and managing upwards with sometimes particularly tricky um, CEOs and C-suite stakeholders. Louise shares some tips and insights on, on the signs to look out for and what you can do to improve your leadership skills. Really fascinating episode. Hope you enjoy it and don't forget to um, follow uh, on whichever podcast platform you listen to this on or uh, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can also find Louise is um, contact details in the show notes to this and that's across her website, LinkedIn and her Substack. So without further ado, here we go. So, Louise Thompson, welcome to the Comms Coffee Club podcast. Hi, Max. It's nice to be here. Super. Uh, yeah. And how's your week going? It's good. It's been busy. So today I'm juggling with the school drop off. So yeah. um, parents will uh, recognize that challenge for sure. Um, but yes, I've done some coaching. Um, I've done some marketing. Um, Great. I'm prepping some stuff for next year. So yeah, it's been good. Great. Super. Right. Let's get straight into it, shall we? Let's wind the clock back. How did you get into comms? Oh, my gosh. Now, this is winding the clock back. I'm actually 47 on Saturday, so we are going way back um, to the early 2000s. So I started in comms at a PR agency um, called Lewis. It's still going today, very successful yep. in London and internationally. And I was a graduate trainee there. So I learned so much about great PR from starting in an agency. Uh, and I would mm. actually recommend anyone looking to start their career in PR and comms goes to an agency first because you just get mm. that grounding. Um, there was someone on LinkedIn this week actually reminiscing about the 8 a.m. Uh, news conference where you spread all the newspapers, broadsheets, tabloids uh, yeah. out on the table and, and discussed it. And you just don't get that anymore. But it was a really, really good way to understand the news cycle. Um, so right. that's where I started my comms career. Um, brilliant. Um, and then I went in-house to a small company. Now, I don't know how many people now remember it, but AOL was once yes. um, an yeah, internet yeah, yeah. giant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you I'd take you way back in the time <laughs> machine. Um, I worked for AOL for a couple of years when they were doing some really big things, actually, trying to get into um, music, entertainment. So they sponsored the Live 8 concert which, yes. again, for the 40-somethings among us, was the 20-year anniversary of Live Aid. It's a massive global event. Um, so I did some really, really fun stuff there and learned about what being an in-house comms manager was. Um, yes. Very different, obviously, to agency, and, and hopefully we'll get into some of that. Um, I then moved to San Francisco. Wow. Um, it was for love. At the time, um, I followed my heart uh, to San Francisco, yeah. but it was a fantastic career move as well because um, I was in the heart of kind of tech startup land. This was back in 2006. Um, yes. I actually um, went to work for Lewis again. They had a small San Francisco office. So I did so much amazing work during that time, repping like emerging startups. Um, it was really fun. Again, I learned a ton. Um, yes. So that was kind of uh, six, seven years um, in San Francisco. Um, yeah. And then I moved back to the UK, had a child, 
um, started to think a little bit more about my values and how they mm -hmm. were leading me and actually went to work for the NHS, um, okay. which was a massive change um, yeah, in terms of uh, sector, just a small one. Um, luckily, I went to work for a hospital trust that really wanted some fresh ideas. And I was like, that's brilliant. I've got loads of fresh ideas and I've never worked in the NHS before. They were like, fantastic. Yes. You're just what we need. Um, so then I went and became the director of communications at an acute hospital trust. So mm -hmm. I've been all over the place um, and done a lot of things in my uh, in my career. Great. Super. Um, and then, yeah, sort of bringing you to the present day. Yeah. Kind of you're now yes. the uh, yeah founder and owner of um, Louise Thompson Leadership Correct. Coaching. So, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Do you want to give us a quick elevator pitch on that? Yeah, so I got into coaching, actually, in that NHS role. So I was a first time director of communications. Um, I sat on the board and it was fantastic. But actually, what I lacked was real insight into how to be an effective organizational leader. So I'd gone from yes. being brilliant at my job in PR and comms to being elevated to this organizational leadership position. Mm -hmm. And there were skills and crucially a mindset, I think, that I just didn't have. Um, there yes. wasn't a great deal of support internally for that. And I think that's often because, you know, communications, there's usually only one of us that's really senior. Um, mm. A lot of people don't really understand at that kind of senior level what it means to lead mm. communications. So I couldn't get a lot of internal help. Um, but to be fair to my employer, they were really great. They set me up with a year-long leadership development course with the NHS and also paired yes. me with an executive coach, which was completely okay. new to me. Um, I remember turning up for the first session and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so busy. There's a million crises going on right now in the mm. NHS. Mm. I, try. I haven't got time. This is really self-indulgent. But I turned up because mm. I had to. And at the end of the first session, I was like, wow this is what I needed, this is what I was missing, someone to yes. ask me the right questions about what being yes. a good leader meant and looked like yes. for me as an individual. Um, and that really got me very curious. So I then started out on a path. I continued working yes. in the NHS for many years, um, but I actually trained as a coach. Um, and then after the pandemic, like most of us, I was a little bit burnt out. Um, I'd been working 16 hour day um, in the NHS during yes. the pandemic. And I thought now is the time to actually go and go and see if I can do this. I, I was 44, yes. classic midlife age for a pivot. Yes. And I thought, yes. give it a go. That's what I do now. I work with patients, professionals um, all over the world, actually, um, to help them lead with confidence and credibility. Great, super, and uh, yeah, and prior to going into into that role at the NHS, had you managed before, or was it literally thrown at the deep end? No, I had. So I'd managed people before, uh, uh, but I think that's very different to leading an organisation, uh, and that's mm. what I talk about a lot with some of my clients, um, and it's what I call the the leadership gap. So in an yes. agency, our agency, there are so many great things that you learn. So you learn, obviously, how to do PR, how to do comms really well, yes. how to a news story, how to respond to a crisis, um, how to position thought leaders. There's so much you learn and you are given a team to manage, but often, so mm. I, would, I think, I, how old was I? Probably like 24, 25, mm -hmm. given a team to, to manage. I was like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I was terrible. Um, I'd like to apologize to anyone that I managed during my first years in the agency. <laughs> I was a micromanager. I made all the classic mistakes. I was really controlling because I didn't understand how to do it. Um, yes. And I think that's where a lot of communications leaders kind of get unstuck because they are brilliant technically at what they yes. do, but no one's ever really taken them to one side and said, that's fantastic. But now I'm asking you to lead a team or teams mm. of people. I'm asking mm. you to have a set of shaping the organization to help make decisions. Mm. That takes a different mindset and some different skills. Um, so I, I learned the hard way by probably doing it wrong for many years until yeah. I started working with a coach and started to learn that there could be a different way. 
Yes. And um, you touched on a couple of points there around skill set and mindset. I guess to I guess to set a bit of a picture for for comms leaders mm. listening to this, um, what are some of the generic or common you know skill sets and uh, mindset traits in a bad leader versus a good leader? Yeah, so I it's it's hard to talk about because I think I was that bad bad leader for so long. Um, mm -hmm. I think definitely micromanaging because you think you know I'm brilliant at my job. I need everyone else on my team to be equally brilliant. So the only way to do that is to do it just like me. And I think that's where a mm -hmm. lot of micro I'm from. They want to control everything because they want everybody else to do it in the way that they did it because they know that works. Yes. I think thing, obviously, and it's an obvious thing when you look at it, you know, from a distance, is that everyone's different. Everyone works differently. Everyone's motivated by different things. Um, so what success looks like for you or what good looks like for you, it's going to be different for everybody. And I think when you're just starting out, you don't really have that understanding of people and, and team dynamics and individual mm. behavior and individual development patterns. You only think mm. of yourself so I think you should lead like me because I'm really good at what I do that's not that helpful if the way that you do it is completely different to somebody else and it doesn't mean yeah. they're not effective it's just you have to understand them so starting with empathy and understanding is crucial but no one no one tells you that they're just like right get on with it mm. go and mm. meet these it's going to make this team brilliant and you're like okay mm. great I'm going to crack the whip and that's how I'm going to do it so I think being a micromanager and being controlling definitely that was how I did it to start with those are some of the mistakes that I often see is that yes. you want to control everything and in doing so ironically of course you you, you know you control nothing <laughs> yes yes yeah yes. and on uh and what does a good leader look like then? Because you mentioned the empathy bit, of course. Yeah, that's very important. But yeah, kind of what are the other what are the other key sort of skills and mindset traits? Yeah, I think empathy is huge actually, because understanding and, and obviously that's a massive trait in communications and engagement, but understanding what makes someone tick is the first step towards actually maximizing their potential and helping them get the most um out of their career. Um, I think having courage. So for me, mm. courage is a massive skill set, value trait, whatever you want to call it in communications. Um, and it's not talked about as much, but when you're sat around that table and there's a massive crisis unfolding and you may have, you know, your board or organizational leaders saying, well, we think the best thing to do is to do this. So let's mm -hmm. hide it away. Let's pretend it didn't happen. And you, you, you know, as the comms professionals, the comms leader in the room, that that yes. is a one way ticket to reputational disaster. It yes. does take some courage to stick your hand up and say, that's not the right thing to do for these reasons. I think yes. we should do X because otherwise Y will happen. So if we do, um, you know, if we do X, then we'll get this result. But often you're doing that, and I, I've been there, you know, I'm sure lots of people listening have been there. Yes. You're often the lone voice, and that's hard. It is hard, particularly if sometimes you're younger, um, sometimes if you're female and you're sat around this table with, you know, often much older people, um, mm. and you have mm. to be the one that's like, okay, that's not the right thing to do, and here's why. You have to convince them. You have to have credibility first step is actually being brave enough to call it out yes yeah and how and and how would you recommend people find that courage find that bravery oh you know go walking on fire in their spare time all that kind of stuff which i've, I've never done any of that um <laughs> for me i mean it's one of my i would say it's one of my values it's one of the things that leads me is to lead with courage and to have integrity and i think most communications professionals have an awful lot of integrity we know mm. what the right thing to do is and we're willing to to do it um but i think it is about thinking through okay if I don't do this, if I don't say this, if I don't put my hand up 
and actually give them proper counsel, then the consequences are could be grave. And then I've, in one instant, wiped out my own credibility because mm. everybody knows, you know, hindsight's a great thing. And after the fact, people will turn around and be like, Louise, what? you knew this. Why didn't you say it? And you have to say, well, I feel like I could. You've got to find that kind of inner strength. And for me, it was always about, am I doing the right thing? Am I discharging my duties as, as a communications mm. leader? And that's true in any sector. But, uh, you know, remember, I worked in the NHS for years, yeah. literally life or death decisions. So you better have some courage in those decisions because people's lives do depend on it. And that won't always be the case, depending on where you work. But if you think through it that way and you have respect for your stakeholders and for your audience, then I think you can start to find that courage to lead, um, lead well as a communications professional. Yes. Yes, yes, yeah. no, and um, no, and, um yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, kind yeah. of your analogy of the NHS and the life or death thing, yeah, I think it probably does, yeah, I think it probably does, yeah, it probably does put things yeah, in perspective a little bit there, but even for, yeah. yeah, so even for wider corporates, I think, um, exactly, yeah, 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 it's very important, you know, to, yeah, to, yeah, the reputation piece, I think, and also what you talked about, the integrity piece, I think that's very true, I, yeah. I think, I, yeah. I think you're absolutely right, most. In fact, every comp leader I know uh, has that internal yeah. dial that knows yeah. right or wrong. Um, yeah. And, you know, some are very good at sharing that <laughs> with their internal stakeholders. Some mm -hmm. are not so good. They, you know, they yeah. might tell me about it <laughs> because I'm a third party and I'm, <laughs> and I'm external. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Yeah, uh, I, I think, um, yeah, uh, I think also we we we've sort of touched on it, but a bit there is the leading with courage, but managing upwards yeah. is a big problem. Yeah. Um, it's huge and a big yeah. issue. Yeah, how? Yeah, um, yeah, how how should or how could a communications leader, um, you know, manage upwards with a with a particularly imposing and shall we say direct senior leadership team mm -hmm. yes 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 that sounds very familiar um i think it is about first of all as an individual and as a professional remembering that that's why you're there and that you are there to serve your stakeholders and the audiences um, that are on the receiving end of your product or your service, as well mm -hmm. as the leadership team and the board, um, you know, and shareholders, if you have, you know, shareholders. So I think the first thing yes. is remembering your purpose. And the second thing is taking time, if you can, to really think through the outcomes of any potential course of action. So the outcomes, the benefits, the consequences and putting it in a way that your leadership team will understand. So one of the things that I coach comms people a lot on, um, and you'll be familiar with this mantra, I know, is yes. outcomes, not outputs. And I think when you're trying to persuade particularly difficult people who may, may be just saying, maybe think they know more about comms than you do, um, mm. it's quite tempting to kind of fall back on your jargon, your technical comms jargon and think, well, you know, we're going to issue five press releases and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And they're like, well, that means nothing to me. Um, so yes. let me tell you what we're going to do. And then immediately you're on the back foot. If you start a conversation with outcomes. So my recommendation is that we shape the narrative to position you as a thought leader in this space for this reason, so that people do this, immediately you're um, leveling up that conversation mm. to a level that a business leader is going to understand and identify with. And then hopefully their answer will be like, great. To be honest, they probably don't even care how you do it. So the mechanics of it, mm. Mm. The press release, interviews, whatever, fine. But this is the outcome that we want. And that's where you need to start the conversation. The other bit of it for me is being able to give constructive challenge. And what I mean by that is, just as it sounds, you know, be constructive, but be direct and be clear mm. 
about areas that maybe you don't agree with and always explain why and always explain a better alternative if you can. And that's where the courage bit comes in again, because sadly, you know, I've definitely been in organisations where other leaders and certainly other comms leaders are, yeah. aren't willing to go there. They're not willing to have that conversation. Mm, mm. The um, the outcomes piece is yeah. is vital. And yeah, you, you gave a really good example there. Um, is that something that people generally get taught? as they go up the ranks no. or no okay <laughs> no no it just doesn't no. happen it drives okay. me mad um so again you know going back to you know agency days and then even in house no one takes you aside and, and tells you that stuff they're just like mm. right get on with it then you're like okay i'll get on with it maybe right. you get some so manager very training technical rather than very technical yeah, yeah. or they might tell you okay this is team management training, and that's great as well, but that's very different, again, from leadership development. So often what you'll see, I, I had this myself, which is why I worked with a coach and now why I'm in coaching, is there's a leadership gap in the communications profession when you leap from very talented PR professional, communications senior manager, head of communications, whatever, um, you know, associate director in an agency, whatever the title is, and then suddenly you're expected to be an organizational leader shaping mm. the outcomes of that business or organization. And that's the gap that a lot of comms people fall into because often, again, particularly in house, if you're the most senior comms person there, there's no one else to kind of really give you that counsel or say, I've been where you've been. So this is how I would do it, or these are the questions I'm now going to ask you so that you can think about your leadership approach and how to make it more impactful. Um, there isn't anyone to kind of call on. So I had to yeah. seek someone externally when I was doing it, and that's why I work with comms people now because they fall into that gap. They know they need to get out of it. I'm like, right, okay, this is what we're going to do. Got it, got it. Got um, it. And, yeah, and... Uh, probably useful at this point then to talk about um yeah how you yeah kind of how you help them and how you do that so so i guess yeah kind of what does a yeah sort of what does a typical uh sort of coaching process with you look like so i think the first thing that people are surprised by and i i was really surprised when i started working with a coach is um it's not mentoring it's not training so if you need me to, I can definitely tell you, right, I would do this. But that's not necessarily going to help you long term in the future. Mm -hmm. What's much better for you as a, as a leader and as a piece of leadership development is for me to ask you the right questions so that you start reflecting and thinking about the solutions that you need to come up with and implement. It's much more sustainable because you've come up with the answers and then it's all about your commitment and your willingness to go and put them into practice. And it's a very safe space coaching. You know, I coach a lot one to one. Um, it's confidential. It's protected. You know, there are contracts and ethics in place to make sure of that. Mm. It can be challenging. And when you are asked to confront yourself um, and the first question I always ask, which is the question that was at the heart of my um, year-long um, leadership development course in the NHS is a critical one and it and it hurts and it's this it's what is it like to be on the receiving end of you as a leader so you are asking someone to think about what's it like to be led by you and often you don't like the answer but that's the starting place you've got to sit with it think about it okay now you know that what would you like to do differently? I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you some coaching models. I'm going to ask you the right questions. I'm going to challenge you. But that's where we start because it starts you thinking about, okay, right. That's not good, is it? I want to change that and here's why. So that that's mm. kind of where it starts. And then it ends yeah. up in yeah, and an what action plan. Just and you're like, right, Sorry, I'm motivated please. now. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, I've, I've got a question on that which I have to ask. Yeah, yeah, um, please. 
what are what are some of the common answers that you get to that question? Because I think there'll be comms leaders who will listen to some of these answers and go, oh shit, that's me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is, it's the oh shit moment. Yeah, that's what we should yeah, really yeah. read. Um, well, obviously I'm not going to break any confidences, but generally no, speaking, and I know this was the case for me as well, it often comes back to, I'm a micromanager. I don't trust my people. I'm too controlling. Um, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm scared that I'm not being seen as credible with certain people for these reasons. So there's a lot of different stuff that it can unpack, but it often stems from, okay, I don't really understand how to put the right conditions in place so that my team can thrive and that I can then have the right level of conversations with my stakeholders. And that's another really common thing when you're going from being a manager or a senior manager or a head of to a director, you're not necessarily there day to day, minute to minute with your team. You may also be taking on teams of people that aren't in your professional wheelhouse. So I, I had a portfolio when I was in the NHS that included areas that I wasn't the expert in fundraising for example community partnerships so unless you trust the people on your team how on earth are you going to get where you need to go because I couldn't do mm. what they do. but what I could do is understand what success looked like how it all tied together and how to get the best out of that team for the outcomes we needed to get to as a trust and that's I think where where I start with a lot of people is understand what makes you you as a leader, what's your unique value, and then apply that understanding to everyone on your team and start the conversation from there. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. That's really good. Yeah. And sorry. And yeah. And sorry for interrupting your flow. So, oh, no, no, no. Please that? do. I, I, you have to. Otherwise, I'll just go on forever. Yeah, it's fine. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, where do we go yeah. after after that bit? Um, so, after that bit, we start to get into coaching models. So I'm, you know, I'm a trained and qualified leadership coach. So I will use established, credible coaching models to get people to examine what their goals really are, to look at the current reality of the situation, which is often the oh shit moment, think through the options with lots of challenging questions from me, and then commit to what they're going to do as a plan of action. And that that's the bit. So at the end of each coaching session, I will often ask people, on a scale of one to 10, how motivated, how committed are you to go and do those things we've talked about, to go and implement them now, to go and do that work? Mm. And if you're not at an eight, nine or 10, we need to go back and examine why. Because coaching, yes, it's very reflective. Yes, it's a protected space and time to think. But it has to be outcomes focused. It has to be focused on objectives. Otherwise, it is just, you know, nothing wrong with this, but it is just mm. kind of a thinking space. But if you're a leader, you need it to translate into something tangible. You need a transformation. You need to know it's working. Um, mm. And that brings me so much, I have to say, it brings me so much joy and satisfaction when clients come back to me, even after like one session. It's working because my CEO you know unprompted gave me this feedback about how mm -hmm. i was approaching a conversation i'm like that's brilliant that's what mm -hmm. you want keep doing more of that mm -hmm. great and um uh on that uh, um, you know clearly the aim is to um is to get leaders thinking about this before yeah. before the shit hits the fan if you like mm -hmm. um but my assumption is there are also people that come to you when, when perhaps they haven't had a great performance review or yeah. um, I've, I've completely, and the phrase has gone out of my head, but what's it called when you get feedback from random people in the business? Um, oh, a 360 review. A 360, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And sometimes yeah, The dreaded 360. Yeah, a 360 review that comes back in... Um, isn't yeah. great <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah um 
yeah, I guess are you are you positioned to be able to help people in that situation as well as the early the the early preventative measure, if you like? Yeah, so I um I'm not a trained HR professional, I am a communications professional, but as a leadership coach, what I will do is help you think through your mindset and some of the practical things that you can do to address that feedback or think about why you received that feedback and what it really means. And I'll, I'll be completely honest, I have been on the receiving end of a less than positive 360 review feedback earlier in my career for all the reasons that we talked about earlier because I was mm, a mm, controlling mm. monster as, a, as an early manager. Um, and it does take some bravery actually to kind of do the exercise in the first place and then to kind of sit with it and not, you're going to take it a little bit personally, but not to take it too personally, but actually pass, you know, what they're saying and be like, okay, what can I work with here? Does any of that ring true to you? If you don't like that, how much are you motivated and committed to changing it? And then what are some mm -hmm. of the things that you could do? Now you've got this information, how could you change that? So I do help people through that. Um, and I've actually written in my newsletter today about appraisals. Um, because it's one of my bugbears. Um, you know, they're often this tick box thing. You're supposed to have an hour with your manager. It ends up being 15 minutes. Someone interrupts. Mm. You're just like, oh, mm. this is pointless. Um, so I've actually written today about how to get a bit more out of that process. But one of the things is you as the appraisee taking a bit more control of it, being a bit more proactive. Mm. So, for example, saying to your boss, can we book a meeting room that's, you know, off site, not in your office? I don't want you to be disturbed because we need this time together. I need this time with you. Just little things mm. like that that you might not think of, but make a big difference to the environment and the outcome. Mm. Mm. How can um, or how can or how should, you know, how should people should respond to to negative feedback or you know perhaps they do have they do have um maybe even negative feedback is the wrong phrase but you know yeah. they report into a ceo or a c-suite you know yeah. leader who is who has perhaps we could say slightly unrealistic expectations um and no matter what you do it's never quite enough how can people mm -hmm. deal with that so I think one of the things I, I talk about a lot is when you start in a role, if you've got a role like that, and, I, and I've definitely been in those roles where I've reported directly to the CEO um, and their expectations are very high, is to understand what success looks like for them and the organisation and why. So too many people in communications just never ask why. It's like, unless you understand why this is so important to them how can you possibly give them good advice so you know it may be that they want to be in a certain newspaper for a very specific reason and you might not agree with that reason but at least mm. you're starting to understand their motivation so some ceos just want they want the limelight they might be thinking about their next move um if you mm. if you have some of that kind of information, you can at least start to formulate a better response and a better action plan. And then it's about you coming back to that conversation and again agreeing with them on what success looks like and the outcome. Mm. So saying mm. if we do that, I think the outcome is this. As the CEO, is that the outcome you're really looking for for this organization? And the answer is going mm. to be yes or no. If they're honest and say no, it's like, okay, well, then let's unpack that and let's think about things that we could do that move us closer to those mm. outcomes that we need as an organization. And I, that is quite a mature conversation to be having with your CEO. But I wish more comms leaders had those types of conversations and really understood what collective success looks like and what outcomes we are all shooting for. So I know then whatever I'm doing in my world of comms and PR and engagement are the right things to get us there. Interesting. Um, Interesting. I, um, I, I'm i slightly um, slightly alarmed at you. Um, you said that a lot of oh, comms no. people don't. No, 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 no. But no, 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 no. A, a lot of comms people don't necessarily say, 
don't ask why because i mm. can remember so i did a journalism degree and it's probably yeah week one week two of year one and i remember yeah. the lecturer set up and said there are five w's you need to remember in your job who what why where and when mm-hmm. and that was drilled Drill. into you yep like every question had to start with one of those and if yep. it didn't it like didn't. fail like, fail yeah 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 so why don't comms people do it why um and and the same questions are asked when you're writing a press release and getting press release training obviously um yeah. in an agency yeah. um i think it's because we forget it's really easy to get swept up in the day-to-day of kind of doing the job and you just honestly you just forget to check in and sense check why are we doing that um so i think that is part of it you can get swept up in the day-to-day the tactical and forget to interrogate the reasons why you're doing something i think the other reason is and i'll be completely honest here having experienced some of these people in my career and i'm sure people listening uh or watching will have done as well is that Mm. some comms leaders are just a bit lazy so they've got to where they've got to and they're quite comfortable and they get on well on a personal level with other leaders, with the CEO. And they don't really want to upset that dynamic, that relationship because mm. they're well thought mm. of because, oh, that person's great. I can just go to them with anything and they'll do it. And they're, they're super helpful. And it's like, yes, but are you doing the right things? Yes, you might be, you know, you might be seen as being super helpful, but is being super helpful actually moving the organization forward? Often it's it's not. And, you know, as you know, and any comms person will know, saying no, it's really important skill to master saying no. And here's why. um, And here's something better we could do. But some people, I think, are just they're just lazy or they're happy to be mediocre. And that really kind of gets me because I'm like why would you be in that Mm. role if you're not Mm. willing to kind of actually articulate why something doesn't work or why something might work better and just try and do it just try and be better so I Mm. think that's part of it as well lazy leadership it's an interesting one um yeah what can people do to arrest that to change it <laughs> it starts with wanting to and kind of recognizing yeah. that you might be that way inclined and some people don't and that's fine and honestly they will float on by in their career and they will be just fine and you know they will get to where they get to and whatever but if you don't want to be like that then you need to start asking yourself some questions like why am i afraid to constructively challenge this senior leader why am i accepting that this outcome is okay when it could be that much better so you know for me it was always about driving to be better i was really curious about things you know i was curious about ideas and discovery but i was also curious about how could that be even better and Mm. you've got to have that level of curiosity paired with your skills and your motivation in order to do it and Unless you've got that, you know, I think those are essential ingredients of a comms mm. leader. If you're not mm. curious, it's like, well, what, what are you doing? You know, it's mm. when people are like, well, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't read the news or I don't really know what's going on. It's like, well, how can you then mm. be a well-rounded, informed, strategic business advisor on communications? I, I don't mm. get it. And I got, I always got ideas from anywhere. Like I can remember because I, I I love TV, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I love TV. So I once turned um, this little scene I saw. Remember years ago, the BBC did the Sherlock series with um, oh, Martin yes. Freeman and Benedict yes, yes. Cumberbatch, and I loved it. And there was this tiny little scene in a taxi, and I watched it and kind of it went into my brain. And then years later in the NHS, I used that in a leadership presentation and it just worked really well. And I, I can't tell you why it came to me, but like I'm taking things in all mm. the time. And mm. I think that's another part of it for people. It's like, unless you are curious and creative, I'm, you know, how are you ever going to come up with a better idea? Mm, mm, mm. Um, what are some other good examples uh, in your career where you've done what that? Career 
be great to have a few. Oh my gosh. Okay. So that, that was definitely one. Um, yes. I can remember. So <laughs> this is actually really showing my age now. I'm not sure I'm happy about this. Um, but I, uh, I worked in Silicon Valley in San Francisco in uh, yes. the mid 2000s. So 2007, 2008. Um, do you remember the, um, it was a company called Linden Labs and they created a virtual world called Second Life. Okay. Um, and for a while, Second Life and, and the, the tech people among us will recognize this. It was this fully immersive virtual world years and yes. years before it is yeah. what it is now. Um, and for a while, it was like the hottest thing in the world. So we were like manning an international press office. It was crazy. Yes. And I can just remember coming up with some of the weirdest, strangest ideas based on this virtual world that just really worked. But that's the point. You kind of have to get into it, don't you? You have to be willing to do something different. I can also remember on a Valentine's Day in San Francisco, standing in a very busy commute subway at commuter time, um, mm. handing out branded roses to people with a violinist playing love songs um, to promote some website or another. It seemed like a great idea at the time. I can remember staying up until midnight mm. with my team, actually taking the thorns off the roses because we got them cheap wholesale and they came with all the thorns on. It was like, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Now I've got to sit and snip them all off. Um, but creative stuff like that, you know, just moves you forward. It keeps you fresh. And even if you're working in a sector, let's say the NHS, where you think you can't do that, I, I bet you can. I bet you can. Mm. Um, so it's mm. always worth thinking about. Um, there's one more, actually, from my NHS days that I, I loved. Um, so, you know, Fitbits. Um, yeah, yeah. So we um, had this idea for staff health and well-being. Um, hospital sites, you know, as you know, are massive. You can walk miles around them. We actually were really cheeky. We just wrote to Fitbit and we're like, well, the NHS, we haven't got any money. Um, we'd love to do a staff health and well-being challenge with the Fitbits. And then we could be a case study. They were great. They sent us 50 Fitbits. They gave yeah. us access to a performance dashboard that you usually have to pay for. And we did this massive challenge. So we had doctors versus nurses versus porters, like yeah, walking yeah, yeah. challenges, steps chat. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, didn't cost us anything because we had no money. Um, yeah, yeah, and actually yeah. ended up in um, changing some people's behaviors for the, for the better. So we had a lot of people that were like, to get my steps in, I now park like half a mile away and walk and all the yeah. things like that. And it's brilliant. But you've got to be willing to kind of have the idea and ask for it. Yeah, I can imagine I can imagine doctors' egos and competitive nature suddenly You're getting right. yes. incredibly <laughs> competitive and like sprinting on the spot in the changing rooms. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's exactly but it was really good. It was kind of, you yeah, know, yeah. motivating bonding. It was free. Um so stuff like that, you kind of gotta be willing to think a little bit broader, ask for what you want and just just do it. Just try it out. Mm. Yeah. And what would you say to um you know, perhaps some of those lady, um, lady, lazy lady. leaders um, <laughs> who certainly not lady leaders. No, lady. Well, <laughs> no, maybe they are a lazy, maybe. lady who leader. Who knows? Um, who are? Yeah, you know. Let's say twenty, twenty-five years into the job. Um, yeah. You know, maybe they've hit a bit of a a wall. They have become lazy. Deep down, yeah. they know it, but deep down, they don't want they to be it. lazy. Yeah. What can they, what, I guess, yeah, kind of what are some simple, practical sort of tips that you can give them to to help them get a bit of that vive and zest for the, for the job back? So I think it, I think it really does start with a bit of self-reflection and thinking about if you are that way, you know, and you don't want to stay that way, how, how have you got there? So how have you let it happen? And then think about, okay, what are some of the practical things I could now do it it might be and i'm bound to say this it might be working with you know a leadership coach to really help you identify the gap between where you are now as a leader and where you want to be and i help you fill in that gap and kind of bridge that gap or it might be just something as simple as actually maybe you need to join a new networking or peer group and actually get some fresh ideas maybe you're in the wrong sector maybe you need to kind of take a bit of a leap and try something new 
Or maybe you can actually mm. sit down with your boss and say, I'm making it my mission and my objective next year to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more courageous, a little bit more daring in my communications practice and my leadership practice. And here's why, here are the benefits that I see. I'd love your support with that. Mm. And then go away and think about some of the small ways. Think about small ways you can start. So maybe if you always put out a press release to trade press and you're happy with that, but it's like, okay, great. What else could you do in that? You know, what else could you do with that information? Maybe you could do one thing that's a bit different, that reaches a bit further. You get that win and then you build from there. But it has to start with you wanting to do it and being motivated and again, being courageous enough to kind of try and make change. Mm, no, nice. No, I think I think yeah, there's some great tips and um, yeah, and really nice points and points there to yeah, kind of to finish on. I think um, yeah, kind of super little takeaways and um, yeah. So how can people yes, how can people yeah, sort of find you, Louise, and get in touch and um, yeah, kind of find out more how to work with you. So I'm all over the place, really. But the best place to start is uh, my website. So Louise Thompson um, is my website, actually. Oh, my gosh, this is terrible. But if you Google Louise Thompson Leadership, you'll find me. Um, I think it's louisethompsoncoaching.com. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on TikTok. I'm very old, but I am on TikTok at Lead with (laughs) Louise, and I'm having a lot of fun there. Um, And I do have a Substack. So um, I don't know if people are familiar with Substack. It's an email newsletter. Um, yes. If you search for a lead with intention by Louise Thompson, you'll find me. And I give you a practical coaching tip every week. It's really good. People are giving me good feedback. Um, and then, yeah, just get in touch through LinkedIn on my website, louisethompsoncoaching.com. I've now rewired my brain. Um, yeah, so yeah. I give you the website address. Um I work generally, I work one to one with people, but I am going to start a group coaching program in January. So I'll be announcing that soon. Um, And yeah, always happy to have a chat. I love talking about comms, love talking about leadership. um, So people can just get in touch and we can go from there. Great. Super. Well, yeah, kind of thank you very much, Louise. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, Is there anything, yeah, kind of you would like to plug or have you got any speaking engagements coming up or any events you're at? Uh, No, but I mean, I'd love to do some if people would have me. I mean, I think the thing for me is my um, lead with intention substack. So uh, disclaimer, it is a paid for newsletter. It's five pounds a month, but I call it a micro coaching service. So for that, you get a coaching, really practical piece of leadership advice every week. So today it's about appraisals and how to get the most out of them. It goes out every Thursday. Um, And yeah, I'm looking at launching a group coaching program for managers and senior managers and comms in January. So I'll be announcing that on LinkedIn soon. Great. Smashing. I will keep an eye out for it. And of course, um, yeah, I'll put all the links um, yeah, to your various bits, LinkedIn, website, Substack as well um, in the comments of this. So um, oh, yeah, kind of once again, yeah, kind of thank you very much. It's been a, yeah, it's been a really fascinating and interesting conversation. And um, um, yeah, um, I'm sure... I'm sure it will chime with a lot of people who listen and watch this. So thank you very much. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Max. Pleasure. Cheers, Louise. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.